And now we conclude our Sundays during the Lenten season of 2022 with James chapter 5. Shall we read together and shall we consider together for our edification James chapter 5 verses 7 through 11. James says, Therefore, be patient, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brothers and sisters, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, my brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endure. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God and shall we pray. Oh God, indeed, we are grateful for the seven-day pattern of gathered worship that we Christians participate in together. It does help us put things into perspective. As much as I enjoyed that game last night, and as grateful as we are to you for entertainment, Gathered worship reminds us that a game is just that. It is a game. And so we gather now. And we extend unto you worship and praise and adoration for your goodness demonstrated to us in the person of Jesus the Christ. And oh God, I ask that you might encourage us as we dig into this text on this fifth Sunday of the Lenten season. Oh God, prepare us, I pray, for Holy Week and for Easter. And it is in Jesus' name that we offer this prayer unto you this day, our good God. Amen. Here's what I'd like for you to do today. Hear me as your pastor when I say to you that I want you to rest assured today and tonight and forevermore that God is full of compassion and God is full of mercy. Hear me say that one more time if you will. I want you to rest assured today and tonight and tomorrow and forevermore that the God who made the heavens and the earth, that the God who sent His Son Jesus the Christ for me and for you, that this God is full of compassion and this God is full of mercy. That is exactly what James says in this text, and I believe what James says in this text. It really is a good word for us as we prepare for Holy Week. We have spent all of the Lenten season preparing for Holy Week. We have spent all of the Lenten season preparing for Easter Sunday. It is just around the corner. For you see, this is what Lent is. This is what Lent is all about. It's preparation. 
It's getting our houses and our lives more in order as we approach the highest and holiest day on the Christian calendar, which of course is Easter Sunday. Now, as a part of our Lenten journey, we have sat with James all the way through Lent. So allow me, if I may, because I'll be honest with you, I forget what I preach sometimes. I had to go back and pull all my sermon outlines up to remind myself of what I said to you the first Sunday in Lent, the second Sunday in Lent, the third Sunday in Lent, the fourth Sunday in Lent was a bit fresher in my mind. So let me remind you just briefly of the ground that we have traveled together. On Ash Wednesday, from James chapter 1, we saw that our pain and our suffering in our lives, that it helps us to identify with Jesus. It helps us to identify with Jesus' suffering and pain. On the first Sunday in Lent, we were challenged together to tame our lust and to tame our passions. On the second Sunday of the Lenten season from the book of James, we were challenged once again not to overlook people, not to overlook anyone that God sends our way. On the third Sunday of Lent, we were challenged from James with the nitty and the gritty of sin. We were challenged to work on things such as jealousy in our lives and selfish ambition in our lives. And then last Sunday, we saw together from James that a successful pattern or an effective pattern for successful Christian living is that we submit to God, that we resist the devil, that we resist evil, and that we draw near to God. So we have covered all of that ground during Lent on Sunday mornings from this pulpit. Now today, as we move into James chapter 5, James informs us that our God is full of compassion and that our God is full of mercy. Verses 7 through 11 that we just read here, they are directly connected to verses 1 through 6. If you were to read James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, you would see that James there is condemning the rich because the rich have abused the poor. Notice, if you will, what James says in James chapter 5, verse 4. He says, Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields, and which has been withheld by you, cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. So the wealthy have been withholding the wages of the folks who were working their fields. And here, James offers condemnation upon the wealthy, and he offers encouragement to the poor. Now, listen to verse 7. Therefore, James says, because of the wealthy's abuse of you, therefore be patient, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. So, the New Testament throughout emphasizes the coming of the Lord, the return of Jesus. However, it's not a major emphasis in James. In fact, this is the only reference we have to it in James. But nonetheless, it's there. He says, you all be patient. Hold on tight until the coming of the Lord, because when the coming of the Lord occurs, everything that is unrighteous is going to be made right, 
And we continue to claim and hold on to that promise today. Now, notice we should understand this metaphor. We are an agricultural community. And this should hit home. James says, the farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until he gets the early and late rains. So as the farmer waits for his soil to produce crop, so are these poor Christians to wait for the return of the Lord. And then verse 8, right? You be patient. You too be patient. And strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. When we are patient during our suffering, it makes us stronger. It makes us more resilient. It makes us tough. And James says, for these Christians who are being abused, for these Christians whose wages are being withheld by their employers, for these Christians that can do nothing about this reality, they cannot resist. James says be patient. James says wait for the coming of the Lord. And as a result, you're going to be stronger, you're going to be better. Just wait. Now, when we suffer, it is very much the truth that sometimes we strike one another. Much like the slap last week that was heard all across the world. I left on Monday morning to go to class to do the religion colloquium. And I said to Anita, we usually discuss Eusebius of Caesarea in the religion colloquium, but I can't imagine that we'll talk about anything else than Will Smith and Chris Rock. And sure enough, I get there, and my students are talking about Will Smith and Chris Rock, the slap that was heard across the world. And sometimes, when we're suffering, sometimes when we're hurting, Sometimes, when we're struggling with patience, we bicker with one another. We slap one another. And so notice James's words in verse 9. They're very relevant. Do not complain, brothers and sisters, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. All right, James is pretty easy to follow this morning. Then he provides examples of people who have suffered and who have endured. First, he gives a general reference to the prophets. I assume the Old Testament prophets who preached the word of God and were persecuted for their preaching who preached the word of God to a congregation that would not listen to them, who preached the word of God in sincerity and truth, and folks went their own way and did their own thing, and disaster came. So James says, okay, you all who are suffering, whose wages are being withheld by the wealthy, you all look at the prophets and look at how they suffered. And then he pulls the best card he could pull, right? The one we think of most often when we think of suffering. He makes an allusion to Job. And you remember Job from the Old Testament, that Job endured the loss of his possessions. Job endured the loss of his family members and his children. Job endured personal injury. And then there was the second half of his life, when things turned around and they got better and they improved after he had endured patiently great suffering. And so, this is James's point. The prophets in Job demonstrate to us 
that even when we suffer, God is full of compassion and God is full of mercy. Notice verse 11. We count those blessed who endure. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings. Now notice this church. If you're drifting, when's the last time I said that to you? I've been trying to move away from that, but I don't want you to drift. I want you to get this. If you're drifting, if you're trying to remember how many ceiling tiles used to be up on that ceiling, whatever it may be, come back. I want you to hear this. Look at this. The outcome of the Lord's dealings. That the Lord is full of compassion. Church, hear that. Even when we suffer like the prophets in Job, even when we suffer like the poor who are having their wages withheld from them and they can't make the uh, electricity payment at the end of the month, even when we suffer, God, James says, is full of compassion and is merciful. Now there's a word for you. There's a word for me. God is full of compassion towards us. And God is merciful towards us even when we suffer. And I, as your pastor, as we prepare to deal with the sufferings and the darkness of Holy Week, and as you are dealing with the sufferings and darkness in your own life, I want you to rest assured that no matter what, God is compassionate and God is merciful. Not only do I believe this, James says it, okay James, I believe it intellectually, but I've experienced this reality in my own life, especially recently. You've heard me reference only once or twice in the five plus years I've been standing behind this pulpit and preaching. You've heard me reference briefly only once or twice my father's death by suicide in 2005. Any of you that have been impacted by suicide, you know that it is an exceptionally unique kind of pain. It's not that you miss your, fa you miss your father any less or any more, or you love your father any less or any more if he dies by heart attack. But suicide just gives things another dimension. It's a pain that I wake up with in the mornings, and it's a pain that I take with me to bed every night. And as true as all of that is, that is so very true. As true as all of that is, I have noticed of late a transition in my grief. So what are we talking? 17 years. 17 years ago this happened. I was in a class at UNC Charlotte, and Lou Van called me, and I had to come home. 17 years ago. I've noticed of late, though, a transition in my grief. These days, instead of grieving the tragic nature of my father's death, and I won't share the details here, however, I don't mind talking about it, if you should ever want to talk about it. I guess in light of my own experience, whenever I hear of someone committing suicide, I immediately want to know how they did it. I want to know that. But these days, instead of grieving the tragic nature of my father's death, 
I find myself celebrating his life. Yeah. It is ironic that my, the church is full of hypocrites fall. I cut my teeth on that stuff. Just get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, the church is full of hypocrites. Me and you, and we're trying to do the best we can. But my, I don't need the church. The church is full of hypocrites, Father. That man taught me principles and things that make me a good pastor to you. Oh, yeah. He taught me so much that I have been able to transfer into my role as a minister of the gospel of Jesus the Christ. And I am so grateful to him for that. In fact, I want to continue to try to help you a bit as you struggle with my name. Um, again, I am so sorry. I do not mean to inflict pain upon anyone. No one. And I hear the frustrations in your voice. You might as well just curse me. You might as well just curse me. But let me help you, if I may, perhaps. Well, first, let me tell you this, for better or worse. I have no immediate plans to go anywhere. The time to make a change like that is when you make a move. So I should have done this in 2011 when I moved to Murfreesboro, but it wasn't on my radar as much then, but I didn't do it. And I had no immediate plans to go anywhere right now. So, this is why the timing is what it is. But a big part of it has been the celebration of my father's life. We share a name. My grandfather, Paul Robert Gillum Sr., who went by Paul. Granddaddy used Paul. My father, Paul Robert Gillum Jr., who went by Robin, some kind of derivative of Robert. And then Paul R. Gillum III, Trey means three, that's me. As a part of my celebration of my father's life, as my grief has transitioned, I value the name more and more and more. It's not as catchy as Trey. It's not as fun as Trey. It's not as youthful as Trey. I know all that. But it is the name that I share with my father who committed suicide in 2005 and whose life I am finally at the point where I grieve less over and I celebrate more. So the beard may go. I'll get tired of that. Senior ladies, don't worry. The beard will go in time. I hear you. I hear you. I've met you now on both fronts. Right? Thank you. Thank you. I asked you to call me Paul and then I'm a beard. at some point, I'm sure. I'll get tired of it. But I want to keep the name. I want to keep the name. Paul. And so, <laughs> James says that God is full of compassion. And James says that God is full of mercy. Even when we suffer, even when we grieve, even when we deal with the premature death of a spouse, even when we have to bury a child, even when our father commits suicide, even when our wages are withheld, even when we are judged because of the color of our skin or the gender of our body, even when we suffer. God is full of compassion. 
passion. And God is full of mercy. And I'm telling you, as your pastor, that James got that right. Rest assured, my flock. Oh, rest assured, my beloved flock. That God, even when we can't see God, even when we can't understand God, even when that mirror is foggier than usual, oh, our God is full of compassion and is full of mercy. 